Welcome back to Having a Gas, the podcast that talks to the great and the good of the creative industries. And today, I'm having a gas with Sean Everett, who is, uh, I think it's fair to say, one of the architects of the sound of modern music. I hope that's not too grand a thing to go in with. Oh, I mean, it's a, it's very <laughs> kind of you. <laughs> I, you should have had... I, 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 I haven't, I haven't, uh, I, I gotta, that's a... A big, big shoes to, to big shoes to fill. Well, it's all right. If you if if, if we need um if we need a sort of a, a humility check, we'll just line up the Grammys in the background. But uh, uh, I don't but, know. but no, it's uh, to, or to, the empty bottles of water. Yeah. Well, I mean, I did. I spoke to Eric Valentine last year, and you know, he was talking about that there was a, a tipping point. There was a a period of microwave burritos and doing it for no money and doing it for the love, and then it just kind of took off and I don't mm-hmm. I, I, I did a skim of your Wikipedia I try not to it sounds lazy I try not to over research coming into these things so I'm not just doing a list of okay next question um, but it seems like it was a bit different for you it, it seems like you had a, um, a sort of a more of an apprenticeship way in is, is that fair oh yeah definitely um, I had uh, I mean I've been engineering since I was about 16 years old um, and front and um, I had a lot of really kind of cool opportunities at at a, at, at a young age um, that like didn't necessarily um, you know uh, get me that far, but like I, I was able to work on kind of I mean cool things kind of sporadically throughout all this time. Um, but then when I um, eventually ended up in L.A., uh, I met um, a producer named Tony Berg who. Um, was also a, a famous A and R guy from um, Geffen Records back in the in the day. Actually, he had a, a at one point he had a label with Eric Valentine. Yeah. Um, and Tony kind of um, really kind of uh, kind of shepherded me um, around the same time he was working. I mean, he he's done this with a few people. Um, like Blake Mills was also around a lot during that time, um, playing guitar on a lot of stuff, and and he was just really good at, at helping um, young people that were kind of really interested in the um audio world yeah i mean or the music i guess <laughs> um and uh he really helped us um and so he put he 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 gave us a lot of opportunities um uh he he had a studio in his backyard and um we basically would show up pretty much every day and um he was just so well connected um in the music industry and had great taste and just kind of like a a real um, kind of strong idea of like the way records could sound. And it was just like kind of a really great um, kind of great uh, uh, place to kind of come up. Um, Cause every day when you'd walk in, you'd never know who would be sitting in, in his, in the chair, you know, like Did- um, for a while, I mean, I was kind of scared cause when I first got here, I, I'm Canadian. I kind of um, snuck down to the States um, in maybe not the most legal way you possibly could. <laughs> Um, uh, now it's all straightened out, but, um, at the time I was constantly paranoid that, um, uh, I was going to just get like, uh, like the, uh, you know, the, the American government would show up and start knocking on the door one day and, and, and ship me back to Canada in like a crate. And one day, um, I was particularly just concerned about it cause it had been going on a while and I just hadn't figured out my green cards and all this stuff. And I showed up at Tony's house one day and, um, um, uh, that was the other thing is like, I couldn't really make any money because, um, you know, we, we'd be doing some like major label records and stuff like that, but they can't pay you, um, because you're not in the system. Uh, and so I was like constantly, I mean, Eric Valentine talking about, um, burrito, I mean, burritos, it, it's like at one point it was like below burritos. Like I just like had, <laughs> I just, cause I couldn't. I literally couldn't get paid like that. Couldn't get in the system. They um, are they and, are like legendarily like swinish there, aren't they? It's like sorry, you're not on our supplier system, so thanks for all the work, but uh, you know, no yeah. money. Yeah, like I would have to like. I, I mean, the only way to make money would be like uh, some, you know, lady in Ecuador would be making like a you know like a, a flute album or something, and like she could pay me, but like you know, Universal couldn't. <laughs> But um, anyway, I showed up to Tony's one day and there was like a, like this like 
Escalade, like a black Escalade. And I was like, oh my God, you know, I've seen enough like cartel government shows to, you know, like, no, this is not a good move. And then I walked in the the backyard and I was just like so scared when I opened the door like that there'd be like a government officer waiting for me. And I remember this palpable fear. And uh, I opened the door and Huey Lewis was sitting there. And I was like, oh. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> massive and you did you did you engineer for him no 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 it was just like that's the kind of like kind of random person that would end up in tony's um, backyard like every day would be just some completely random thing you know it would just constantly like not even just musicians he's just like a, a, a tony berg is just a jovial human that likes company and and likes um kind of people around and so he friends with a lot of random people so you just I, I mean it was just like a you know I, I'd come from uh, Canada and um, basically you know you grew up in like a like a mountain town and and like the only you know person you see is like the the kind of drunk guy that's always like um, you know which province were you I, from uh, Alberta you're from Alberta as well yeah okay yeah, yeah. the Texas of Canada yeah, it's the Texas of Canada. I love that. So, it was it was it a small town? Yeah, I grew up in a small town and it was just uh yeah, I mean in some ways kind of like kind of like Texas a little bit, just kind of like not not heavily right wing, but like a kind of like a a more a, a more Texasy kind of political um bend on it and and just um you know, I was always not necessarily um, interested in like the same things that um, a lot of the people maybe from there are, are interested. I mean, a lot of people like hiking and sports and, and um, you know, skiing and <laughs> any outdoor activities, you know, that require hiking boots. Um, and uh, that was just not my thing. Like from, you know, the moment I was born, it just wasn't what I was interested in. At, well, at you know, all, I, so. was, I was, I was going to uh, ask why you didn't go to somewhere like, I don't know, Toronto instead of LA, but I'm presuming mm-hmm. the weather was part of it. Well, um, when we were like, when I was, um, probably about 16, I was just, I was getting into engineering and stuff like that. And, um, we, we didn't have like, um, a lot of vacations when I was young. We just, you know, we weren't like a, a rich family or anything like that. Um, but when we were 16, my dad had sold a building and, and he got a bunch of money and we, he was, you know, got the family and we were getting, you know, a little bit older and he'd be promising us Disneyland since we were kids and we, we hadn't made it there. And so we drove down to, um, LA and that's right when I was really getting into music and, you know, I was looking at the, I mean, I was already really into music. I've been playing in bands and stuff for years and I was just starting to get into recording, but um, I would look at the liner notes and I would see that, you know, 75% of the albums that I loved were recorded in LA. Right. And then we were, we were there and, and I just, you know, already being cognizant of that. Um, sorry, the dark barking dog. It's okay. Um, <laughs> um, uh, hold on. Brussels. <laughs> um, uh, just being cognizant of that. And then, um, uh, being in LA and just kind of feeling the energy of the city. At, and it was just like, I remember that it was like kind of a very eye opening um, trip. Like it was kind of felt got a little bit beyond a vacation. It kind of, it felt like a sneak peek into my like adult life or something. I just, I just knew it when I was this there. Is like, like, this like, is the nineties, is it? Nineties LA? Yeah. 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 This would be like nineties, probably in 97 or so or something like that. Good times. Um, and, um, uh, and I just knew that I, I was wanting to be there and wanted to end up there. And, um, I just kind of had made it my kind of life goal that I would, I would find my way there. Yeah. Um, and you yeah. said, you said that like 75% of the albums you loved were from there. Let's hear some of them. You know, what, what was it that what were the albums that made you think I want to do this with my life? You know, like what was your, for Steve Albini, it was the Ramones unsurprisingly, you know, what was your thing? Well, Radiohead at the time, I mean, this is not, a, I mean, Hail to the Thief is an L.A. album, but I mean, they're not a particularly famous L.A. band. But I mean, that's what was really inspiring me at, at that kind of time. Um, it was just really great record making. You know, every sound 
on on an alb- on a on a track had like a really kind of unique tonality and like everything had really been thought of um where it felt like you're entering a world um in every track uh and i and i that really inspired me um things like you know tom waits as well and stuff where it just felt like you were in an environment and it was just um it, it felt like a you know a painting every every track d- w- was beyond just a song it w- it was like kind of a, a sonic journey um just it was like beyond just a recording you know yeah this anything is what, that sorry oh sorry oh yeah so any anything to me that felt like it was something that was beyond just a recording you know um where i could you know feel that there was like a lot of energy and and um thought put into the art of it um and and uh, specifically kind of the la stuff um i mean john bryan the stuff that he was doing i was you know the fiona apple stuff was really exciting to me um her her second record when the pawn um i'm not gonna say the full title (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I'll be we'll be here for the rest of the podcast. <laughs> um and then um uh I I really liked like, you know, the Paul Thomas Anderson movie Magnolia and I would hear, you know, Amy Mann on the soundtrack and it, you I just had this kind of vision of this LA world where, you know, Paul Thomas Anderson and Amy Mann and Sean Penn and um you know, uh, Fiona Apple or just like hanging around with, you know, Quentin Tarantino. It just like, it felt like this when in that period of time that felt, you know, just a really cool environment of, of things happening in LA. And it was just really inspiring. And, um, I just thought I, I, whatever is happening down there. I mean, you'd hear about John Bryan doing these shows, these like legendary shows at the Largo and stuff. And it was just, uh, I just, really was inspired by the whole thing and, and wanted to come. And then you'd hear about these studios like ocean way and cello studios and stuff like that, um, which is now East West, but um, you know, and you just see that all these really cool albums were being made there, you know, including hail to the thief. Um, and I was just, you know, I mean, I could go to Toronto, but I mean, Toronto has a, a great music scene as well. I mean, I'm, I'm working with a band, a great band from there right now called always, um, oh, as in uh, Marry Me Archie. Yeah. Love that yeah. record. Brilliant. Yeah, they're just an incredible band. Um, I love them. Um, you know, there's lots of great stuff going on in Canada, but but the e- extreme amount of great stuff that was happening in L.A. just seemed like that was, I mean, where I wanted to be. So, like, mm-hmm. it must be like a dream come true because you mentioned PTA, you know, Paul Thomas Anderson, um, and... Uh, Magnolia and Fiona Apple, but now you're a part of that moment present day. You know, you work with Heim and Heim connects you to Licorice Pizza, you know, PTA. And it's like, you know, does it, does it feel like you've realized the dream? I mean, sometimes it like, I pinch myself a little bit. Like recently I was mixing a Heim song. Um, the last song they put out that was like a, um, it was like a little, um, they 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 put it at the beginning of licorice pizza like uh, when they were um when when they would show it in the theaters they would have a, a high end music video before the 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 um presentation i guess yeah um and there was a a little moment at the beginning of the um video i mean paul thomas anderson just directed i think probably 95% of their videos and he had directed this one as well um and there's like a moment kind of like a beauty pageant at the beginning of the video and um, they needed somebody to kind of be the announcer. I mean, they'd already filmed it, but they needed someone to do overdub the voice of the announcer in the video. And and my uh, wife was around, and um, so Daniel Hyam had her reading the part. And then um, Paul Thomas Anderson phoned in on FaceTime and was like directing my wife. Yeah. And I was like, man, this is just like. <laughs> completely a dream come true for me just watching um him direct my wife and my studio was just like oh my god this is the best thing that could ever happen that is no no seriously incredible stuff (laughs) and we're going to talk a fair bit about heim um shortly because as you can imagine you know i've told a lot of people that i know we're having this conversation and you know a lot of my circle are in love with those records and you know the war on drugs and alabama shakes you know all the the big the big hitters so um so we'll get into that stuff but i was um 
I wanted to know if, uh, because frankly of the way that you present yourself, which is just, you know, so it's unique for a producer to look more like you should be the rock star. <laughs> did you come <laughs> did you come down wanting to be the musician and wanting to be was that was that the dream or was it always engineering, always producing? Yeah, I never had any interest in being the um the, the star. Uh I I I used to be in bands and um I used to I I mean I we, we I went on a few tours, you know, when I was younger and I just hated it. I, I mean, I would literally uh, actually throw up before playing a sh any show. I just right. it gave me so many nerves, and and it's not the um, part of the art that I necessarily uh, get off on. I, the being on a stage doesn't brings me no joy. I mean, being in front of people and doing something live is 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 like not part of my brain. I mean, that that really. Uh, uh, most people I know love that feeling. They love playing a show. They love that that kind of energy. I don't get any energy from it. I just get terror, fear, um, bad feelings, cold sweats. It's just not my thing. I mean, I like to be, you know, like alone in a dark room, you know, crafting. That's pretty much uh, all I like to do. You know, the you know, the, the, the less people around the better. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's just, I, I like the art of putting, um, the, the design of it, you know? And, um, yeah, not necessarily the performance. It's the, it's the design, you know, obviously the getting the performance when you're, when you're in the studio, but, but like in front of a, of a crowd is not necessarily something that I, I like. Yeah. I mean, the reason I dress like I do is just because that's how I've always dressed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. It, it, it's I mean, really... I just, uh, I, I think that, uh, I don't know, there's like a, a lot of like, I mean, there's, I just, I don't know, there's like kind of, there's like kind of like a, a, a just a, 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 sta a, like a standard way that you, you know, you can dress. And I always kind of just, question exactly maybe maybe why it has to be that way you know i just you know it's fun to be fun yeah so um i just like to you know have fun <laughs> well i mean that's 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 like uh that's just the creative impulse manifesting itself isn't it it's like everything is this way i want to see what's outside that and um i'd like to know if you feel like let's you know let's get a bit let's get into the craft now because you said that's the that is your first love as far as music is concerned is being in there and sculpting it and the sonics of your records are remarkable i'm not trying to you know blow smoke as we say I, it's Thanks. just it, it has to be said um so firstly what do, do you remember uh, i mean you mentioned tom waits you mentioned um Hail to the Thief. You know, were there any other records where you thought the craft on this is incredible? Not just how did they make that, but also the the hi-fi quality is so, you know, it's so it's a rich. The, the the quality is high and the originality of the sound, you know, is also mm -hmm. there. Were, were there any records that made you think I want to make that kind of a fingerprint, you know, on the industry? I mean, all the Nigel Godrich records at that time, I mean, the the Beck stuff included and the, the Paul McCartney record that he did as well. Um, I mean, uh, the, the Travis record that he did. I mean, he was just really raising the bar on how good things could sound, but also um, how kind of beautifully designed they could be. Um, and um, I mean, when I was growing up as well, I mean, I think the first time I ever really realized what record making was, was when I was, I think in sixth grade, I was really, I mean, I was always into music, but I think there's a, a something around when you're 11, you, you, music becomes part of your identity a little bit more than, um, than when you're young, you know, you're just listening to stuff and you like it, but, but yeah. when you're 11 or something, it's something around that age, then you clicks in a different way. And right when I was that age, they, um, they put out the uh, Beatles anthology, um, the series, um, which is really hard to get nowadays. You can't really buy it anywhere, but it was an, this incredible um, TV series that ran, I think one installment per week or something like that. And it just kind of moved through their career. And um, it started off, you know, kind of um, 
in the early days and, and stuff with like, um, and, and I, and I liked that part of the, the, the series, but then they started getting into the more psychedelic stuff. And, you know, when they were really, um, you know, getting wild and, um, you know, George Martin was really, you know, going off with them. Um, and I remember one episode they were talking about, you know, specifically around like the zone of, of like, uh, you know, um, I am the walrus and, um, and like strawberry fields and a day in the life. So and then like magical, the, magical mystery onwards. Yeah. And like, yeah, like Sergeant Pepper, you know, revol- even revolver, you know, all, yeah, yeah. when they started kind of using the studio as an, as an instrument, yes. um, then I, I don't know if I had kind of seen that before and, and, and kind of like going through the journey week by week of watching the, the kind of progression of the kind of creativity in the way that they would use the studio. Um, it felt like it was like pulling me in. Um, and I mean, I d- didn't obviously grow up when the Beatles were going off, but by watching these like weekly installments, it kind of felt like I was kind of going through some kind of, you know, like this kind of transition work that they did. It, it kind of felt like I was witnessing it in a way as close as you could um in the 90s yeah uh, uh feel that you, you know that feeling that I'm, I'm sure most anyone who was in this you know went through that journey in the 60s felt um and it just it it like triggered something in me and, and it i think i always wanted to be maybe like a film director but like that series specifically may have like actually changed my life i mean it really like it really was a big deal. I mean, I just saw what could be done and it, and it, it, it made me rethink everything. Yeah. It made me rethink like even the music. I mean, I was in a band, but I was just immediately thinking like there's, I mean, I, I can't just keep going to band practice and just playing the drums. I mean, I need to figure out how like every single song can have a, the drums can have a unique identity that is, tailored to this particular track yeah. um and and that really got me thinking about that yeah because mm-hmm. especially if you're like if you're sonically curious and you're you know you're a drummer in a band which i was as well mm-hmm. you become very frustrated that you can't get that kit to sound like anything other than a just kit in this tiny room with this like horrible horrible little noise and a kick drum in my case that goes for, yeah. for, forever and yeah no i want it to sound like maybe the drum solo from the end with the do, 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 or the cliche being you know when the levy breaks it's like i want to know how to do that and you know valentine said this as well he's like when when you hear those led zeppelin records he was thinking how did they do this like the how mm-hmm. is one of the best feelings when listening to a record you know not knowing and being like oh, i wish i could do that yeah, I mean, th- all these great records. I mean, this the not only are Led Zeppelin great, but like the the sound of their albums is so specifically tailored to the music that they are r- r- making. I mean, the drums sound is specific. I mean, if you d- if you had the wrong engineer in there, I mean, if you had Led Zeppelin playing exactly the way that they were playing, and you had like like you know just a kind of standard miking assortment and stuff i mean they would still be great but the vibe of of those recordings really uh kind of drives home what the 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 emotion that you get out of those records i mean it's it's a big part of it i mean i mean not not to like uh make it sound like like you know like like they're not incredible i mean i mean i mean the, 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 there's like like the, the, like if they were recorded in a different way it would it'd still be incredible but it's just that the way that that was recorded i mean really 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 uh is a b- beautiful um kind of just it just adds to the the kind of feeling that you that you get out of it i, I think it's really um I just think it's really beautifully recorded. And and that goes with a lot of albums. I mean, the way that like a Smith's record sounds, I think is, is just as important as the songwriting in, in my opinion. I mean, it sounds so specifically like them. I mean, the way that a joy division record sounds 
is so important to the, the, the you know, all, all these really great bands have found something that really speaks to the, the you know, it really is like symmetrical with their songwriting and it, it enhances it. Um, it's a, it's and I, sorry. Oh, no. Yeah. I mean, I just really kind of get excited about that. It sounds a little bit like you're sort of articulating a principle about making a classic record, which is that a lot of time with me and my colleagues, we have a little a little music production business in Manchester, which I was happy to hear you talk about the Smiths and Joy Division. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we're always like, how can we get this to sound perfect? But, um, you know, she's lost control, doesn't sound perfect, but it sounds unique. And it sounds like one of the things you're bringing out there is uh, sounding unique is essential if you want to really put a stamp somewhere in history. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think a lot of attention, it, you know, if you go to, I mean, like a recording class or a recording school like that, there's a lot of time spent learning things, learning the way to do things correctly, which I mean, I, I had, you know, a lot of that kind of education. And at some point I felt like I had to unlearn a lot of it. Um, um, because there, there is like maybe a way to do something that, that sounds maybe better. Um, but I think that you kind of always have to be thinking of the larger picture of, of what it is that you're making and like how it all kind of tonally works together and what the, 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 what painting you're painting. I mean, recently I've, I've, you know, I actually, it's been, I've been doing this for a while, but, um, it sounds like just like, kind of like this art school cliche, but like, if you try to make something like when you're recording something and, and you pull out a painting and you actually try to make it sound like that, it's going to change the way you record something completely. Like if it, it refocuses your brain away from just getting the right mic, uh, the right this, the right that, you know, and trying to make it sound as, as good as possible. But like, how do you reflect this kind of image and, and, and record something that sounds like that? Um, it's a, it's, it takes a, a, maybe a little bit of, of practice to kind of refocus your brain because like you can say it like, oh, I want to do this, but you have to commit to it. Like you have to actually do it. I mean, and a lot of people kind of like get distracted by, you know, something else along the line. They, they forget the fact that like, you know, oh, I'm supposed to be doing this painting or whatever. That's, you know, bullshit, whatever. But like, you like really do it, you know, like really go for it and, and try to make it sound like the painting is like a, is it like a tricky thing like obstacle and um it's really uh um gratifying to to um just focus in on that and just do it you know because i feel like yeah i feel like when you hear an uh, like a joy division record i mean i think martin hannett is maybe one of my favorite produ producers ever i mean the way that his records sound i mean like even like a band like esg these puerto rican girls from new york um, just incredible sound. I mean, it sounds so futuristic. I mean, the album could come out today and it would, it would sound just as futuristic as it did when it came in the, came out in the eighties. Um, but like he really, it feel, it felt like he was painting a picture. It, it doesn't feel like he's, rec he's just recording something, not even, I mean, not even close. It's like, it's so uniquely designed and it's such an amazing world that, that he's creating. Uh, and so really we, inspiring. And so when you're talking about this painting practice, this is, some, is this something you actually do when you're producing a record? You're like, we're going to make it sound like that. Yeah, I was working with an artist recently. And we went Before I recorded a note of the music, um, he had uh, played me all the songs and they were on acoustic guitar. And um, I took him to a museum. And, and for three days before we ever recorded anything, we just walked through museums. And I said, just pick paintings that remind you of each of the songs, you know? And it was like a, you know, not a fast process because you need, you need to kind of hunt for the feeling, you know? Yeah. And then we'd end up in front of a painting. He goes, this is it. This is this song. This is what it feels like to me. And it, and it felt like I was connecting to the music in a different way. Cause you know, you hear a song on acoustic guitar, it means something to you, but that's not necessarily what the artist is trying to tell you sonically, you know, I might have, I might project some kind of idea on a song 
um, as, as far as the production that isn't in symmetry with what the artist was saying, you know? And so, um, some of these paintings that he was picking were like really, um, maybe more aggressive and darker and, and, and more layers and kind of like, and kind of browns and, and things like that, that, that I wouldn't have realized that the song felt, I mean, I could hear it in the lyrics, but like, it wasn't, I don't know if I would have naturally maybe produced a song to having a feeling of that kind of thickness and darkness and like urgency. Um, if I had just, if I had just heard the song, but when you give me the painting that it's like, Oh, you are really communicating something like pretty heavy. Like I knew it already, but I didn't realize how far this could go. And it completely changed my, um, the, it can, it changed the entire album, to be honest. I mean, every song, uh, it was just not what I would have done. The, the painting completely refocused my brain, you know? That's really it, um, encouraging to hear as well because it's you don't, you're not bringing a process to every record and going, here's how I do the thing. You're, you're trying to explore a different space every time you make a new record. Yeah, I would go insane. I mean, the, the thing that I think is the most insane thing is when you go to a studio and someone has the mic set up <laughs> and they have always had them set up like that, you know, like, Oh, does the drum sound good there. That's their, their mic and they're good. I mean, no, <laughs> Yeah. I mean, that's a crazy way to record to me. I mean, that is like, that is the opposite of how, what I want to be doing. I, the, I mean, I think every single time you record a drum set, you should tear it down and then redo a new, a new thing. I mean, you should not, uh, it's a, that, that to me is not um, record making. That's just that's um, that's record. That's preserving uh, a you know a moment in time. I mean, you could do that with your iPhone. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Yeah, I know what you mean. It's 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 trying to. Oh, what is it? This um, Alan Parsons was it? Alan Parsons who said this. He said, uh, "Audiophiles don't use your their equipment to listen to your music. They use your music to listen to their equipment." Yeah, <laughs> it's a little bit like that, right? It's like you've got all these, got all these different uh, artists and all these different songs, and they're all going to sound like the same record. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you, I'm you're trying to avoid that big time. I mean, I, I really, really try to go out of my way. No matter any project that I'm doing, I try to like t uh, go at it from even any mix that I do. I try to um, at least the way I start it completely different than the the way I. I worked on another album because I just don't want it to sound, I mean, naturally things are going to end up sounding maybe kind of sometimes close to maybe something else that I would have done because you just have tendencies that you do and, and things that you reach for and, and ways that you like kind of um, certain things to hit. But uh, I try to go out of my way to make it a different experience um, just because I just don't want to get bored and I just, I just feel like it's not fair to the artist and that I, it should be tailored to what they're, what they're writing. You know, it should be based around what they're doing. Not, not, well, not, well, not what I, well, not what I do, you know? Yes, yes, yes. And this yeah. is, we're really, we're really close, uh, sort of focusing on an important area here because it's been on my mind a lot and recently whilst doing these podcasts and also whilst trying to do the comparatively insignificant work that I do. We, we, we make soundtracks for adverts. We don't make records, but, um, um, but we're still trying to figure it out. And um, um, so there's a few things uh, that, are, that are associated with this. One thing Andrew Shep said when I spoke to him recently is he said when he's mixing, he's, he, he is using sonics, but he's trying to feel a certain way. He's trying to adjust everything so that, I don't know, when the transition goes into the chorus, emotionally it changes something in him. It, you know, instead of mm -hmm. not trying to make it sound right, trying to make it feel right. And, you know, he was saying, I, I can only do that with the sound, but this is the radar I'm using, you know, rather than these. So um, it's and it seems like that's something that you concur with. You're not thinking purely in terms of sonics. Yeah, I mean, there, there's like, when it, sometimes when you walk into the studio at the beginning of the day, I mean, you're not going to necessarily be in the right headspace to be um, zoning in on uh, on a song in, in the right way yet. Sometimes 
sometimes I'll be in here for eight, nine hours. And I, I mean, I will just be doing like, you know, I'm making it nice, you know, is the kick drums nice or whatever, you know, it's nice, you know. And then like you, you're at some point, but like you've never really connected with the song emotionally yet. And you know that like you've made something sound nice, you know, but... Um, and then people will be maybe, maybe pressuring me like, Oh, I, I, did you, did you mix it? And I'll be like, yeah, I, I did. Um, and they'll be like, Oh, send it along. But, it, but I, and then I, I'm, I just feel weird pressing send. Like I can't because I haven't had the moment that there, I just feel like I need to have a moment at least with a song at some point where I actually kind of like fall into it. Um, and there, and there is like a there is I think a moment when that happens if you work on something long enough I mean you'll eventually find that zone and sometimes it's it's usually for me it's like I have to work like nine ten hours and then somewhere kind of getting close to the like late hours of the night when you know you stop getting text messages and emails and things and people stop calling you and you just have long period of concentration where you can really zone in and then all of a sudden it just starts kind of wrapping around you in a different way and then you feel it and then you're 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 working on something emotionally yeah. you know now you're doing moves that are like musical you know, cause now you're in the zone, you know, and it took, you know, eight, nine hours to get into that kind of feeling of it. You know, you're really sinking in it at that point. I mean, sometimes it happens as soon as you walk in the room, but I mean, you know, not every day is, is going to be like that, but I try to at least find it at some point once a day so that, cause I feel like I'm not done a song. I'm not done working on a song until I, I kind of experience that kind of a uh, second layer of, of, uh, of of you know feeling it sounds like you're like where you're in it it sounds like you're like the the buddha sitting under a tree and then you know enlightenment is what you're waiting for that's when you know that you're really working on it yeah it just it just it really just is and you can just hear it differently you could hear the the feeling of the of the room and and the and the the world that you're creating and then and then like you're not just adding like a reverb you're 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 finding something specifically that is that is part of like the world building you know yeah you know you're 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 not just color correcting a scene to make it look clear you're coloring correcting a scene to make it have some kind of emotional um value you know you're you're making the it you're making it bluer because you want it to feel sadder and and like you're really connected with that shade of blue as opposed to um you know just using like a uh, what are that? I don't know. I don't, I'm not a graphic designer, but a lux or a la or whatever they call them. In the <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, but it, <laughs> there's, there's like, there's a trope in, um, in, in movies and in, you know, mythology and in stories and stuff that comes back that, um, uh, that comes back again and again, which is something like, um, you tr obsess over the rules and the process and you go through the frustration and you spend a lot of time thinking about details and trying to learn learn how the thing works and then at some point just magically all that evaporates and it's just in you embodied all mm. of that knowledge and then you, you like like what you were describing you're sort of just kind of flying through it with a different type of knowledge or a different type of with different ears almost you're not you're not listening to oh, 500 hertz there's a bit too much of that you know like yeah i yeah. mean yeah that's always on my mind i just but i mean the like you know you'll be sometimes grabbing 500 hertz even when you're in that zone but like i mean you for sure probably will but it's i'm trying not to keep i'm not i'm trying not to think in that technical mindset where you know your science mind is is doing that part of it i try to maybe do that earlier in the day yeah and then and then get into that other zone i mean for many years when i was you know just coming up mixing it you know i don't know if i was thinking well i think when i first started that is exactly how i was thinking i was never thinking in the technical zone because i didn't know right from wrong you know i was just only designing that was all i knew how to do so i mean nothing sounded any good but like it, it had a, a world around it um and then I learned all the, this technical knowledge and then, you know, so now it's like a balancing act of like trying to get back to the, the feeling of when you're, you don't know anything yes, and you're yes. just having fun, 
but you know, balancing that with all the things that you've learned along the way. Um, and, and the more that I do it, the technical knowledge, I just try to keep it just pushing it back into the back of my mind. So you just do it, um, kind of naturally, but not thinking technically like, uh, um, you know, a lot of people come in, in, into a studio and they see all the cables and buttons and things and they, and they, uh, they think that you're doing like a technical job, but I'm, I'm really trying to not do that, you know? Yes. And yeah, something that, um, I, I've, I've been in my, I've been doing what I do for about five years now, it's just, you know, not mm-hmm. a huge amount of time, but I, the point is I've been through the kind of the beginner stage and may, you know, the kind of the frustration of when you kind of know stuff, but you just have, you don't have enough solutions to, to draw on to make the sound that you want. And so now yeah. we've got other people working with us and seeing them go through the same thing. And it sounds like you had your, you just said stuff didn't sound good. It sounds like you also had your moment wandering in the desert where you're like, I know what I want this to sound like, but God damn, I've spent hours on this thing and it just sounds like crap and it's just like really i can i can hear i can hear eq you know i can hear eq moves mm-hmm. sounding you know and, and when do you feel like you broke out of that and suddenly you could just you knew how to cook so to speak i mean i don't think i ever did i mean i still every day go in and most of the day is is a, is a periods of frustration where you're looking for something i mean if i just knew how to do what i wanted it would be really easy. I mean, I would, I would yeah. have to work so hard. I would just come in here and just, you know, just do that and then leave. But like, I feel like I really have to go on this journey to kind of get it out of myself. I mean, I have to go, you know, hard yeah. and it's like, it sucks. I mean, it doesn't feel good a lot of the time. I mean, you're beating yourself up and you, and you know, you have self doubt and you, you listen to the car, you hate it. I mean, it doesn't go away. It's not like, I don't feel I don't feel like I, I, I can just do it now and I'm happy. I'm sure. I, I mean, it, I mean, I think that if I got to that point, then that would be maybe a danger. That means like you're not pushing yourself. Um, it means that you're kind of relying on something, which is, which is exactly why I am so maybe horrified by the idea of drums being set up the same way constantly. It's just because like, I don't want to rely on on anything like that. I, I always want to be trying to find something that I don't know how to get. Yeah, um, yeah. And 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 that's what keeps me um, energized. You know, that kind of mystery. Um, you know, because no no record sounds perfect. Um, uh, it's you know. I mean, maybe it does. I don't know, but like. No, I know uh, what you mean. Though we were saying before, yeah. weren't we? I, I, we talk about this a lot in the office. Um, about the Smiths, you know, because that mm-hmm. the in some way, and uh, you know, I'm gonna get crucified for this. In some way, the sound of Smiths records is horrible. Like it's it's mm-hmm. just, it's just like metallic and narrow and reverbs that are really audible. And but it's the sound, it's the perfect sound of those records, you know. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. There, it's I think because people's idea of like what the the correct way of recording something is is like a full range frequency where it's like you know you're you're equally represented re- represented from 30 hertz you know to tw- 20k um and it's just like beautifully like perfectly balanced and, and all this stuff but sometimes that's not what um what speaks to you emotionally you know yeah it's the same i mean it's like it's it's to, I mean, bring it back to painting again. I mean, you don't go into a, a like a museum and and every single painting is the is like an equal dis, you know they've dispersed all the frequency of colors through this painting perfectly and like oh man this is a great painting you know it has equal amounts of red with the blue and the yellow and it's perfect you know like it's just a great painting because i can see all the colors perfectly i mean it would just the whole museum would just be a rainbows yes you know it yeah, would be, yeah it would just be non-stop spectra <laughs> yeah it'd be a horrific um and so uh, i think that music is just like that you know and and i think that it's that the the way that music is that recording is often taught is it's a it's a little bit colored by the idea that it has to always be like that which it doesn't you know and the smiths are a perfect example of that it's it's there's not full range frequency there's not you know but it's perfect it 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 paints the picture of that band in such a, a, a an amazing way and and and, you, and it it generates it 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 doubles down on the emotion that the band's creating 
um, by, by using sonics to, um, kind of just, uh, enhance it. Um, and, and I think because of that, it's like, you know, it's one of the best recorded al- you know, well, albums, yeah. I mean, uh, their, their discography in general. I know what you mean. And it does sound like what it's like to be around here in Manchester, it's certainly what it would have been like in the eighties. You know, there is a kind of coldness and a bit of a narrowness to it. You know, um, it's appropriate for where it's from. Joy Division captured the same sound. Yeah, I mean, I, I often wonder that why some of my favorite sounding records are, are from Manchester. And then you read about the smokestacks and like the, you know, the hardship and like, you know, the gray, you know, and the cold. And and then you kind of, you kind of can see it. I mean, I've recorded albums in New York and I've record, recorded albums in, in LA. Um, I mean, specifically like um, the Julian Casablanca from The Strokes. I did um, two albums with him by his solo band uh, or his side project, The, the Voids. Um, and we made one in New York and we made one in LA. And I think that the, because um, it's one band that I worked with in two different cities, I think that when I hear those albums, I hear the LA one and I, it sounds to me like LA and the, and the New York one sounds like New York to me. It was cold. We were in the winter. We were working in the middle of the night, you know, above a bookstore because we couldn't start till 11 o'clock at night. And it sounds like that to me. It sounds like it represents like the feeling of that time and space. And I think that maybe that's partly why I uh, love the sound of albums from Manchester, because I mean, I like the cold feeling of like, you know, I like a a sad, you know, I don't, I like, like, I like, I like, I like that emotion, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, And so I feel like sonically that those albums kind of, uh, they, they, they feel like that. In the same way that you can hear, um, for, oh, forgive me, what's Nirvana's debut album called? Bleach. Bleach. You can mm-hmm. hear you can hear them move from Seattle to LA when they do Nevermind. In a way, you can hear. Oh that. yeah, yeah, yeah. You can. There's like a kind of scrappy, wet coldness, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, even though it, you know about a girl is basically like it's, it sounds to me like a Beatles song, you know, but played right. in Seattle by Nirvana. Yeah, yeah, and then there's that kind of hot LA slickness by the time. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So um, another, so because doing that thing where I've got too many things I want to ask. One of the things I was uh, circumambulating as well before about you know the young engineer problem when you think in too too technical a way and not musical or not emotional enough perhaps. And I could be wrong about this, but that's what it strikes me. I remember spending many years thinking you know you listen to something. And you're thinking, ooh, that sounds wide, or ooh, that doesn't sound, that sounds narrow. And you spend, I think, some time tunnel visioned on the the quality of the recording. And firstly, does it does that uh, is that consistent with your experience? And secondly, if so, is there a moment where you can finally sort of pull out of that and appreciate the emotion and the and the music again? Um, you mean like? Sometimes if I'm listening to an al- an album that I like and I and I'm really thinking of it technically, yeah, like, um, I mean I mean more like when you're coming up, when you're just learning the craft and you just you think too much in terms of stereo and and frequencies oh, and stuff, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that like it's it's important to think about frequencies, um, like even even when you're, I mean that's because that's what you're dealing with. That's like it's it's you know, the frequencies are are your paint. Yeah. Um, so, um, no, I think that maybe what I'm getting at is that like, it doesn't necessarily mean that you, at, when you're trying to make something that you have to, you know, you don't have to fill it in, like in the technical way that, that mean that like, that's, you, I think all you're trying to do is create an emotion. You're trying to create a picture. And, um, I think that like if you're a little narrow in your low end, but that speaks to you emotionally and that, and that kind of represents the feeling that you're trying to get at more than, than pushing the bass in a way that, that people say is the correct way. Um, yeah. then, um, I, I think that that, I think that that's just a, it's a, it's a good exercise. One, one really good exercise is, I mean, copying, um, if something rep- represents like something emotionally for you, I mean, a good ear exercise is like, you know, if we're talking about the Smiths, you know, like if that's something that, that represents something emotionally to you and you're working with something that, that you want that feeling out of, 
it's like maybe maybe the band doesn't necessarily sound like the Smiths, but like maybe even in your spare time, maybe that's not what the band wants, but like you could do a mix in your free time of like just make it sound like exactly like the Smiths. Like go like listen to the kick drum. What 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 does it sound like? Like just how do you get it as close to that as possible and A B it like heavily. Now the snare drum, you know? Yeah. And it just you learn so much from doing that. Just like uh, you know, cause you rely, you constantly otherwise are relying on yourself and, and what you just imagine a snare drum to sound like. So you're always just doing that. Yeah. But like, if you copy something else, it gives you more tools because now you've learned how to make a snare drum sound like this now, which you might not have ever done by yourself. So you just are gathering this information and it's like a good exercise to learn more about things that you, you know, you wouldn't have necessarily learned, you know? Absolutely. Um, so I think that, um, I mean, people are, are horrified by the word copying, but that's what you're doing anyway. I mean, when you are w working on anything, no matter what kind of creative project you're doing, you are, you have gathered resources throughout your life, information about, you know, music you've heard, the way that things sound, you know, all these things. You're not working in a vacuum. Yeah. You've been inspired by things and whether you know it or not, you are copying something you've heard, you know? Yeah. You just might not be able to discern or say what it was that you were trying to copy. Yes. But like, but sometimes to be honest with yourself and say, I'm copying things anyway, just like, let's just try to, actually do it, you know, and see what we learn from that. Maybe you don't use it. Thing is, is like, you could, you could like make a song that doesn't sound like the Smiths sound exactly like the Smiths and you don't have to release it, but like, oh, you've found a really cool snare drum sound that like, you like your other mix better, but what, what happens if that snare drum, cause that, it, that maybe that other snare drum wasn't serving the emotion, but like, let's just import the one that we did from the Smiths mix into this one. And like, voila, like you've got like a whole other feeling that like, you know, you know, now you're cooking with pepper, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. And, um, what you were saying before as well, there's something in your imagination. Well, you know, that's from a record you've heard. There's a reference track in your head. Why don't you just yeah. listen to it and try and get it there? Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just, I mean... No, yeah, no, I mean, literally no, no, nobody works in a vacuum. I mean, maybe the only example I can think of is like maybe the Shags. I, I mean, that, that band, I mean, they, they supposedly had like not really heard pop music and their, and their father bought them all these instruments and made them write a pop album without it. And they literally, I think were working in a vacuum supposedly. Um, so, I mean, that's like, <laughs> it sounds wild. Um, and I think like as f in my brain, that's as far as I can, th that's as close as I can get to thinking of someone working in, in, in a vacuum. <laughs> yeah. So this, um, this bounces really well onto um, something. It's not really, it's not as much a question as such as something I wanted to maybe inform you about. So one of our, my colleagues watched your mix with the masters and um, he brought he brought into the studio one day. He said, uh, "This has changed the way I think about mixing from Sean Everett's mix with the Masters." And it's from oh. when yeah, it's from when you had <laughs> uh, reference track, the mix you were trying to work on, and using multi band uh, a multi band compressor, but just soloing each band so you can kind of get uh, zoomed in on what's going in going on in each <laughs> frequency range, and. Honestly, it leveled up his mixing like stupendously. I don't know if he'd be able to do it without a reference mix, but this this a very similar principle you were describing. And I think is this something that just happens when they say when the artist says we want it to sound like that record or mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's it's I mean that specific um, kind of uh, thing you just mentioned that that kind of uh, way of working. Uh, I don't know how I figured that out. It wasn't someone something someone taught me. Um, I, I just came across it one day cause I, I, back, um, when I first started using pro tools, there wasn't as many plugins obviously as there are now there's millions, but, um, that was kind of like the first multi-band, um, uh, compressor plugin that I had access to, you know, in like 2000 or whatever it was. Oh, right. Yeah. So um, very early. Yeah. Um, and I would use that on maybe on my master bus or something like that. And at some point I just soloed. 
I think it was because I was interested in like hip hop low end and like, mm. how could there be so much? Yeah. Um, and I was trying to make it like kind of, I was trying to do something like that and, and it would just blow up my car and I couldn't figure it out. And at some point I realized I could solo the bands. There was like six bands on that multiband compressor and I, and I soloed one of them. And I realized that I could, it focused my brain on being able to just hear what the low end was, what, what was happening on, in like on the, one of the hip hop references that I was listening to. And sometimes like, you'd be like, I was cranking like the low end, like crazy, but then you solo it and maybe it back and forth, just the low end with what you're doing. And, and even though you feel like you don't have enough, like you've actually have too much, like comparatively to like what yes. the, and it's like a magic trick. It's like, they've got this specific amount, but then they're like mid ranges here. So like that, get, it's like a, you know, it's like this balancing act. And it was just like, Oh, by doing this, I'm focus, focusing my brain on one region and I can design that region, mm -hmm. you know? And you, and it just, I learned, it gave me such a leg up and I was able to learn about different kinds of record making from doing that. Like all this stuff where, I'm, you know, I'm super into like the way, how much low end is on a Smith's record, you know, and, and what emotion, does, you know, you know what the emotion is when you listen to a Smith's record, but it's like, specifically what is happening and like the way that I was able to start breaking that down kind of genetically was by able to soloing certain frequency bands and like really thinking like what okay so between 100 and 500 like how how much kick is there and like what does it sound like in that what does the kick sound like in that region you know and it was just like thinking about all of that like it was able to I was able to focus in a different way you know yeah and um, do, do you use that technique a lot yeah, I mean, it's like the day that I like figured that out. It's like been probably one of the main things that it's the biggest thing I ever figured out. Honestly, I don't think I've ever figured any. I don't think I've ever figured out anything bigger. Well, you <laughs> that know what? was that, the biggest that, thing. That's really <laughs> appropriate because um, what we in in our studio we the way we refer to it is we say okay we'll get it we'll get it just about into position and then we'll Sean Ever at the mix we just that's <laughs> what we say that's funny so, it changes like if you just do it it like you can be lost in a mix like completely lost and then you just kind of like if you just kind of do that for like 30 minutes with a reference and zone in on something you can reshape your mix completely and like it can really like magically change what you're doing. Like, like it can, it can save you, um, completely. You like, you can feel lost and then 30 minutes later feel like, okay, I, I'm back. I have a handle on this now. I'm like not swimming around in like the shark tank. And when you're, when you're in those frequency, uh, bands soloed and it, it'll sound alien at first to, um, to people, uh, because, you know, let's just say you solo the, you know, 120 to 400 range and suddenly it's like you're underwater and it'll be, mm -hmm. oh, you know, it might freak you out a bit. But uh, when you're in those zones, are you, do you, are you thinking comprehensively with your mix tools? You know, are you thinking, are you using dynamics? Are you using EQ? Are you, are you using more um, dramatic effects or are you just thinking in EQ terms when you're in a frequency band? If I'm like in like a specific frequency band, I'll use anything at my disposal, like compression, EQ, co like gating, like whatever I need to do to that zone to get it the way that, you know, you want it to be. Um, and it's just, there's so many incredible mixing engineers and, and like, you know, some of these people are mixing on like an SSL and they have their own unique routing and way that they work. And it's like, I mean, I could go learn their mindset and like get into that. And like, a, it'd be like a whole thing. It's like a lifetime journey. Or you could, do, you could like solo and, and figure out what are they doing? You know, it's not the SSL. It's like how much information is being pushed in these different regions. It doesn't really matter if it's an SSL. It's just like, it's like they're getting something through their process that like, how do I break it down and kind of, um, fabricate that kind of feeling. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I feel like just by doing that with, you know, different types of records, different types of people and like applying that to different types of things, you learn so many techniques and like, and like, it's not just like, 
it, it, maybe you had like a snare drum sound that you like to get, but now you have like a hundred snare drum yes. sounds that you, you know, because like you've now kind of like kind of figured out all of these different tools and techniques and, and ways of getting something that, you know, this just opens up, you know, opens up your mind in different ways, you know, to, to kind of figure that, that out. Right. That's, that's, that makes sense because it tripped me up at first because I was just, uh, I was just soloing the bands in my own mix and kind of trying mm -hmm. stuff. But it sounds like part of what you're recommending is start by making sure that you know you're you, you're soloing these frequency bands, listening to a lot of other people's music, figure out what's going on in there. That's the educational resource. Yeah, yeah, because you're not. Yeah, you're you're literally because if you don't have something to work against, then I mean. What you I mean? You could be soloing, but you don't know what you're listening for. If yeah. you're, but you're, a, if you're a being with something that you really like, it's it's a it's like I think it's like an educational tool. It's like you're. It's a way of learning how other people do things um, by kind of understanding. Because at the end of the day, all our, an album is is that is the way a bunch of frequencies sit together. Yeah, you know, um, and it's it's just a. a, a a, a portrait of that and so like by kind of y you know y it's like being like, like an art historian and, and figuring out what paint someone used you know you're just kind of like looking through it with like an infrared lens trying to figure it out you're trying to see the the painting that was there before yeah they you know they painted the mona lisa or whatever um <laughs> you know oh there's like a there's an old lady under the mona lisa you know you're using all these tools you know to figure that out and i just think um yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, I think it's, uh, for me, it was a kind of life-changing because it was just, otherwise you're just sitting there and you're just like lost, like, why does this sound so good, you know? And yep. I just, sometimes I feel like what I need to figure something out is to just focus in on kind of the micro bits of it. Yep. Um, I mean, it's the same thing, you know, scientists do. It's like, we're human beings, but like, why? You know, like, let's like, dig down into the atomic structure and then it's like, Oh my God, there's, can we go any deeper? Like, Oh no, we can. Oh, oh, like, Oh no, we found the God particle. Like we don't, we don't even know what, like we're like, just like, it's like this, you know, endless wormhole of just discovery. You yeah. know, we live, we live in a giant mystery and, and, and you know, it's, it's, uh, represented by, we, 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 we basically live in a, in a fabric of, uh, of, of fr frequency information that is just being kind of like sent at our faces, you know, like we're, you know, it's just like all we're experiencing is all these frequencies just being kind of blasted at us. And like, I think sometimes like music is maybe why we respond to music is because like we just live in a, in like a, in a world of frequency, but I mean, all literally every single thing that we experience is, is frequency information and, and music is a way of harnessing that and like, um, harmonizing it. And it, it's, it's like a, a way of living in reality that feels more in harmony than like the kind of, um, chaos that, that, that we are, are kind of like this constant stimulation of, of light frequency and sound frequency. And, and, you know, the dog barking over there is like chaotic information. It's chaotic frequencies that are kind of getting blasted at you. That's what music is, is just like, is like a harmonic version of that. It's like, a, it's like a, a flowing more, um, beautiful representation of, of what we're, we're experiencing anyway. So, um, I feel like, I mean, I'm just going off on a, on a rant, but I mean, that is essentially what it is no i know what you mean um, we live we live in a we live in a landscape or let's say a soundscape of chaotic frequency information music is bringing that into abeyance in a way that is pleasing yeah i mean and i think that when you start getting into like particle theory i mean you you realize like that it gets so deep that at some point they're like we don't even know if this particle actually exists like it might just be a, a frequency 
Yeah. And like just crazy stuff. And you're like, oh my God, like what are we just all like this vibrational wave that's like, you know, all this stuff that you start thinking about when you're like stoned, but like maybe is actually what's happening. Like, we, you know, we just live in this kind of like vortex, this field of, of wave information. And like, are we, do we even exist? Are we just like part of this fabric of space time? That's just like this, like, you know, like this clashing of frequencies that just is now us. We don't even know. But anyway, music feels like a part of that. And like, um, we're just trying to do our best job <laughs> you, <laughs> trying you, to, you know, represent, uh, you know, some kind of structural harmonic system that we as human beings kind of like, uh, get off on. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, you know, we just, we don't know what the hell we're doing. So it's just like, pe there's a lot of people that have come before us. So, you know, what did they do to, to figure this out? And it's like, you know, learn from your masters, you know? Yeah, that is, that is absolutely. I mean, that's why, that's why I'm doing this series, frankly. Uh, it's, uh, uh, just a way to data mine people who know way more than I do about this stuff. So, <laughs> um, so th thanks for contributing to that process. I'm I know that you've ha got appointments this afternoon. It's nine fifteen p.m. here, but over in uh, beautiful uh, California, it's not. So, um, <laughs> I was hoping I could just have fifteen more minutes of your time to go uh, uh, go over uh, one one more subject. Yeah, which is um, something that. Um, occurred to me recently and this was as a result of a discussion with with Andrew Sheps uh, was that um, I had spent a great deal of my time trying to learn to you know make music on workstations I've not spent much time in studios uh, the way that you have so it's just it's just been an adventure on Ableton and, and Cubase mostly um, and most of that time was spent thinking about individual individual elements ah how do i get that kick drum you know how do i get that mm -hmm. how do i get those keys obviously there's a time and a place for thinking like that but andrew shep said it's not just about those you know the key billy preston keyboard on the let it be album yeah. sounds sounds so perfect he said it's not just about that element it's about how it all goes together and um you know it it it, it, it occurred to me that when trying to produce something i was always kind of thinking because I, I, got, I got the experience to work with a great mix engineer uh, over the last few years. I'd be like, I can make any old crap, and even if it sounds like crap, I'll send it to the mix engineer, it'll come back sounding good. And mm -hmm. it, it eventually came around to this way of thinking after talking to Sheps. It's like, no, it will, sound, it will sound right together before it's mixed. Obviously, mixing just slots it together more perfectly, let's say. Mm -hmm. but, um, but it has to sound right on the way in. And um, I really wanted to know that about your process does stuff you're trying to get the sound sculpted perfectly before you go to mix uh i mean that's kind of, i feel like that's almost kind of sometimes like an arrangement question um because a, a great arrangement is really going to help you sonically um because when you have an i mean like like a string quartet is designed in a certain way because it 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 fills in specific areas of frequency and so when someone writes a string quartet they're writing a specific part that fills in this frequency zone and then you have a, a, a you know a part for your viola that fills in this frequency range and then you have a part you know um and and so it goes i mean but like so classical music is essentially designed like that i mean no one was mixing at that point because you know you couldn't but but like they were kind of mixing it by arranging it in a certain way that um, was really kind of really beautiful. And so um, I think sometimes what happens in modern recording is that is all of that knowledge that, that people gained in kind of the olden times of music where like things were arranged so specifically, like this part is made for this location, you know, um, that I think that with the modern tools that we have, where we have, you know, every software, you know, synth known to mankind, you have like every kick drum sample you could possibly get. Sometimes when you're writing or making a song, you aren't necessarily like thinking about that, you know, cause you have all these great tools and they, they sound good, but like, there's like, there's a lot of ways to kind of accidentally kind of fall off the boat. Cause like, you know, sometimes I pull up like a, a synth sound and it's like that synth sound has every frequency known to mankind in it, you know? So like, what are you going to do with that? You know, like you could 
put it and a lot of times I'll get like a song to mix and you know I'll have like the rhythm section sounding pretty good and then all of a sudden like I'll encounter like the synth sound that's just like enormous tonality that I don't know what to do with it you know it's just taking up the whole entire range and it's like it's it's not necessarily designed in the same way that it, it could have been and that and maybe people are used to it that that way because they've had a rough mix but i mean it's not really um it's just not designed in the way that maybe like when i really get off on something where it's like you know a great arrangement it's like this is serving this purpose specifically you know like we it is designed for this reason you know um and i just i you know, you, it, it happens a lot. You'll get these pads and all these sounds that are just so much sound, but then you try to kind of tailor it, but like people maybe aren't necessarily used to hearing it like that. And so like they kind of like turn it down, but it's just like, it's not necessarily helping the cause, you know, it just makes things muddier and you really have to like work harder to figure out how to get all this stuff to fit in. Yeah. So I, I think when I like, when I'm really feeling it, it's like, and when everyone's on the same team and everyone knows why they're putting a specific instrument in a specific location, it's like, this is here for this reason. I mean, the kind of standard rock band arrangement where you have a guitar player and you have a bass player and you have a drummer and you have a singer. I mean, that for the most part kind of fills in a lot of the areas that you're trying to, to, to fill out. Um, so a lot of kind of classic rock albums sound great because i mean just naturally those cut instruments sit in those kind of zones but as more modern um record making takes hold and and there's less people kind of maybe educated in that um and a lot of people with access to recording um i mean it's not like it's not like people don't naturally gravitate towards doing that anyway but it it can become a problem where people don't necessarily no, and they're building these kind of very maybe confusing arrangements like like another thing too is like sometimes i'll get a song to mix and and like once i'm i've gotten through the rhythm section and like the guitars and the, the vocal it like sounds pretty good because like i i i mean i might have figured out like how all of that could sit in a cur certain kind of zone and it's sitting in like a specific kind of frequency range where it's like it's all working you know but when people were working on the track, they weren't hearing it like that. They were hearing things lacking. They were hearing things, whatever. And so they were filling it in with a lot of other information that they didn't necessarily need because they weren't hearing it right, you know? So now you've got, look down and you have this landscape of synths and guitar parts and all this stuff that people expect to be in their mix. And it's like, you don't need it. You know, like all of the, you had a, like you had it in your like original part, you know, guitar part, you know, yeah. like it's all in the guitar part, like the original part, but like, you don't need all of this, you know, yeah. or like you'll, you'll, you know, like someone will be like playing like some like rock piano over top of it. But like, that's also can be crazy. Cause you know, a piano has, a, has a lot of information in it. And if you ever, you have like a pretty built up, um, rock arrangement with like a lot of frequencies happening. And now you have a guy playing his left hand and his right hand and like all this just like pummeling you with more sound. It's like, where do I, where do I put this? You know, it's yeah. like the piano part might've even just needed to be like two notes, you know, and that's, that's maybe all you needed to fill in like a, a, a missing range. But like, so it, it, sometimes mixing can be pretty, um, frustrating a little bit when you know that someone wants all this information and you're like, yeah. uh, like a little screwed, you know, cause you're like, I don't know how to get all this in here. You know, it's like a lot. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the phenomenon that I was describing when you're, a, you've got a poor arrangement and you're expecting the mix engineer to fix that for you just with mm -hmm. the, the magic of mixing. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I think that maybe there's like a, there's a lot of kind of, um, 
there's a lot of uh, kind of weight put on maybe sometimes mixing at this stage in 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 time where like oh he'll fix it they'll fix it you know and there's there's a lot of times when uh, the mixing engineer is kind of expected to make an arrangement that doesn't necessarily work work yep they're also expected to like make sure like the the performances are correct i mean like um i mean back in the day um uh like you know in the 60s it was certainly not the uh the the engineer's job to make sure the drummer played in time you know um i mean now it's sometimes like uh uh can you quantize the whole performance for me yeah i mean it's not it's that's not necessarily true all the time but like sometimes people will send it back and they'll be like you know it just sounds out of time (laughs) and you know that's fine i'll fix it you know but it's like it's just like a different we've kind of entered a different kind of paradigm where it's like people know that a, a mixing engineer can do almost anything you know you know yeah it's just like i mean i've i've been in trouble before because you know someone says that their their vocal is out of tune and it's it's like well that's a strange phenomenon in this period of time where it's like that's my fault my fault <laughs> <Yeah>. you know <laughs> Uh, you're like, okay. You're like, are you complaining to me or are you just observing that? Yeah, like some somehow now somehow now everything can be my fault, you know? Like <laughs> like the arrangement doesn't work, the drums are out of time and the vocals out of tune. It's like, well, I mean, okay, I mean, I'll fix it all, but like it's like it's weird that we live in a time where that could be my fault, you know? You know, it's <laughs> it's a weird it's a weird thing when I again, I'm, I say I'm saying this to Sean Everett as uh, like I've made anything worth making, but I'm just saying, you know, we've all mm-hmm. All of us at some level have made records, and I, I when I I'd make stuff and I'd send it to this mix engineer called Jeremy Hagri who studied with Yoad Nevo, and mm-hmm. um, it would it would come back completely different to how I, like the demo sounded, how I thought it should sound. But I always found the best things to just go, okay, that's how it sounds now, that's fine, and you just get used to it. And I think mm-hmm. you know, do you have to wrestle with that kind of demoitis as Leslie Braithwaite calls it? Like that, it doesn't sound like the demo anymore. It's like, no, because because I've mixed it. Yeah, I mean that's a constant. I mean, especially nowadays because people have their own recording r- system, and like they get their mix happening and they like it a certain way. I mean, it's more and more that way. I mean, back when I first started, uh, home recording was a lot. Uh, was like, I mean, it was much harder to do a home recording than it is now. I mean, and if you did do a home recording, it sounded pretty crap i mean you just didn't have the technical ability like, and like then a now guy you to buy, buy voices yeah i mean now you have like a like apogee syst you know and all these things and like it's it's easier to get a hold of things that can make yes. it sound generally pretty good um so people can create rough mixes and things like that that they can get used to really quickly um and maybe Back when I first started, it was like you kind of all gathered in a space and you would work on it together and you would kind of all work on it through time. And you didn't necessarily always just have this like kind of rough mix that someone had made at home that you're kind of battling. Um, So I just I feel like as the years go by, that becomes kind of more of a of a of a situation. Um, And I'm constantly like battling uh i mean sometimes sometimes i mean i'm I'm not even saying that mine's better i mean a lot of the times i I feel like i'll do a mix and then i have to learn from someone's rough you know because they do have like a magic in it that i didn't pick up on yeah and i have to go back to it and go oh like i see what they're they're saying here you know like i mean maybe i did this thing and this this works a certain way now but like there is a fundamental vibe that they had figured out in their rough mix that I now have to explore. Um, the tricky part is like, um, kind of keeping people's nerves at bay and, and no, and knowing that like, um, you know, it's mixing is stressful, I think for almost all artists because like it's, it's represents them and it like comes out and it's like their project. It's not, you know, my project. Um, and so they have a lot in the line They you know, they're, they're, they, artists make a lot less albums than I do, yeah. you know, it, they, it has to represent them. Um, and so, um, you know, you have to be cognizant of that and, and just like really listen to people and, and also, um, ease their concern because the th- the thing is, is that I, I'm not worried technically. I mean, like, 
I mean, if someone didn't like a mix that I did, the thing is, is that I'm confident enough tech in my technical ability that if we talk it through, I will give you what you want, you know, like definitely. And, and I won't fight you on it. I mean, unless I'm like, this is insane. Like, I mean, this is legitimately really like, I can't hear something like really important to the song. Um, but like, if you're just trying to tell me, like you're trying to paint a certain type of picture, I will go down, I will go hard for you. You know, yeah. I will find it with you. Um, and it's, I think that once you get that trust out of someone where, where someone knows that, that you will find that for them and like, uh, I will go on that journey with you, but you, you know, you just, it has to be like, you know, it has to be the, the people, the longer that I work with people, I think that it, it becomes like a better and better relationship a lot of the time because they know that I will work and find it for them. And they know that I, I can, but we just have to like kind of find it and have the conversation about it and, and do it, you know? Um, but yeah, so I think that like, yeah, especially when you're working with someone new and, the, and, 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 and that's, that's like a rough thing too, where like someone will send you, you know, like, especially sometimes people will put up people in like a mix competition. They'll be like, you know, I'm going to get five people to mix a song and I'm going to pick one or something like that. And it's like, sure, like the fourth guy, you might hate the mix, but like at the end of the day, if you'd worked with them and gone through the process, like that probably would have been your favorite mix. Maybe it was your least favorite first, you know, you chose some other thing, but it's just like, I think it's just like working with people and it's just like, you have to have a good relationship and explore all these things together. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so on that, on that note, working, this will be the last question, I promise. Um, <laughs> Working with people, I just wanted to get a little bit in about uh, the war on drugs and um, and working with Adam. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, how long have you guys been working together? Which albums have you done? I should have looked it up, but you know, I probably met him. I don't know. It's getting uh, maybe about seven years or so now. You weren't on Lost um, in the Dream. Uh, no, but I was on a, a d deeper understanding. So you're responsible uh, for that guitar solo in. Um, uh, I, why have I gone blank now? Is it? It's not disappearing. It's a. Uh, is it strangest thing? Do 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 oh. do do do. Uh, you know. Oh yeah. Oh, I, I definitely am not responsible for it. Um, I mean, Adam has like a, a an incredible idea of tone. I mean, he is uh, oh. like second to none. I mean, like his guitar just playing. St I mean, and the way that I mean, he'll take a guitar tone and like he'll bring it home and run it through some of his machines and stuff like that. And like he really. It has just a great mind for that kind of thing. And sometimes, sometimes like, I mean, I don't think I'm a conservative engineer by any means, but like, I'll think someone things distorted and then like, I'll be like afraid to even sometimes like maybe push it harder and like he'll come at back, he'll come back and he'll have run it through like another layer of something. And it will just be so much more like, like harmonic content and juice in it. And just amazing. And yeah, I mean, I, I love working with him because, I mean, he's just not afraid. He's not, like, he's not afraid to go for something. He's just yeah. really open to, like, the the painting of it. I mean, he's a painter, you know, that that's what he that's what he started doing, basically. I mean, he was always a musician, but, like, he studied painting. Yeah. And so he's really into this kind of stuff and uh, just, like, a, a joy to work with someone like that because, I mean, now... Um, we have a great relationship and like there, there is a level of trust there, you know, um, where it's like, we both can kind of work and with, I mean, without the anxiety of knowing that like, you know, we're not, you know, working against each other, you oh, know, they might drop you if it goes wrong, you know? Yeah. Trying to find like a, a, a harmony in it, you know, like within the work, you know, we're, and we're just, we're both, you know, just looking for something and it's just a great, it's a, it's a great friendship to have when you can kind of trust someone and, and, and look for something and, and go on a journey with somebody, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Because sometimes it can be a battle and you can be like this thing where like it gets too intense for no reason and all these types of things. But like, if, if you both have a real passion for uncovering something and, and going on this journey, there should be no, there should be no fighting or arguments. It's just like, you're, you're just, you know, you're part of the same team, you know, yeah. and you're, and you're looking for something and, it, and it's just a, it's, it's such a great feeling to find those people in, in your life, you know, where, where you're like, oh man, I've like, I found somebody that, you know, will, will, 
will explore with me. You know, it's like, you're just looking for someone to, you know, my, my, my daughter in the morning is like looking for someone to, you know, play with her, you know, just, you know, like pick up the toys and, you know, make, th- you're just looking for someone to have that conversation with, you know, yeah. in, in life. And, and, and that's, and, and, and when you find it, it's just a, a great thing. So he's not like looking for someone to do something for him. He's looking for an exploratory partner. To, to, because, you know, the music, the war on drugs does sound like that. It does sound like a journey. It does sound like a romantic painting. And, you know, and, and the sounds are just gigantic. Um, so it, it, it's a testament to that relationship and the way that he works. You know, like we, we would, tangent, we went to see him, me and my friend in 2015 on the uh, Lost in the Dream Tour and we waited outside for him to come out at the end, you know, and he was just the <laughs> sweetest guy because a lot of people would be like, no, 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 keep away from me. But, you know, he stayed out and hung out with us and we were like, well, why didn't you play Suffering? He was like, I don't know, it's slow, you know, so. Um, yeah, he's a, just an incredible guy. I mean, like, it feels like you're with your friend. I mean, I mean, there's no, it it, it it doesn't feel like you're, you know, with a, with a guy that's, you know, lording over you in any kind of like, weird rock star ego way at all i mean he's yeah. like like a great dude yeah absolutely yeah. um i could talk to you for another hour uh but uh, <laughs> you, we you know you've got stuff to do uh, i hope we can do this again it's been really good well thank you so much for having me no yeah, and i really appreciate it. it was nice to talk to you as well and it was, it was worth the wait because i know we've had this in the diary for a long time but um <laughs> Yeah, let's uh, let's 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 talk more records next time. Um, I'm looking forward to the Always Project. Uh, uh, you know, so um, do, do you have any idea how far along we are? When's that going to be out, or is it a long way off? I I, I don't know their like release schedule, but it will be coming. <laughs> <laughs> any, uh, you got anything yeah. else coming out soon? People can listen for. Um, the Yeah Yeah Yeah's album coming out soon. Cool. Um and um. I can't remember. There's a lot of stuff coming out all the time. I just can never remember. <laughs> well, my, my account director, Vicky, wants another Heim album soon, so hopefully that'll be happening. But uh, they're on oh, tour at the moment. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, really good stuff. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for being here. <laughs>